Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's quarterly webinar. As a reminder, due to the high number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute during the presentations. If you have questions, please submit them to the moderator in the questions box located on your control screen. Presenters will answer questions at the end of each presentation. Here is today's agenda. Our featured guest is Stephanie Norling, Managing Director of Communities of Excellence 2026. Upon completion of her presentation, we will have questions from the audience and then updates from the Baldrige Foundation, the Baldrige Program, and the Alliance for Performance Excellence. And now it is a privilege to introduce Stephanie, who will be talking to us today about pursuing excellence in communities. Stephanie, thank you for being with us here today. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, to learn more about Communities of Excellence 2026. And thank you to the Baldridge Foundation for this opportunity. Um, let's see. For those of you who are new to Communities of Excellence, I'm going to provide a brief history and context to how and why we started this work. And then we'll talk a little about the framework, how we support communities in its adoption through our National Learning Collaborative, and provide some examples from the communities that are using it to date. So let's get started. Communities of Excellence is a nonprofit organization, and we've been so since 2013. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for our nation's residents by assisting communities in implementing the Baldridge-based Communities of Excellence framework. This organization came about based on the experience of our two co-founders, Lowell Cruz, former CEO of Heartland Health in Northwest Missouri, which received the Baldridge Quality Award in 2009, and Rick Norling, former CEO of Premier, which received the Baldridge National Quality Award in 2006. Lowell's experience in Northwest Missouri was really the backdrop for this work. He came to St. Joseph, Missouri in the early 1980s to lead Heartland Health, and at the time, both the hospital and the community were struggling. In the hospital, he was looking for something that would help transform the performance of the organization, and this was before there was even a Baldrige framework in healthcare. But it was very clear that the health of the healthcare system was tied to the health and the well-being of the community and the residents within. After seeing the impact in his organization, it was his observation that working with the community to infuse Baldrige quality principles, a common language, and evidence-based decision-making into the community itself was the next logical step in the use of the framework and an early driver of this effort. So fast forward to 2010 and Rick, Lowell, and some others are talking about their concern and sense of urgency about some of the huge challenges we face in this country. And it was this conversation that kicked this whole effort off. So this is the hypothesis that they started with, was that the Baldridge framework that they knew could transform organizations could be adapted to achieve performance and ex excellence in communities. Now we focus primarily on the four core sectors that you see here, education, health, economic vitality, and safety, because they are so interconnected. Depending on the community, there will be other key sectors that must be involved, but at its core, we believe that you cannot be a community of excellence without gauging, engaging these key sectors. So we've all seen these statistics, and we all know the sense of urgency and the complexity of these issues. There are many incredible organizations addressing them, and they have important roles to play. So as we look at our role in improving community performance, it's really about strengthening the community as a whole, recognizing that it's a complex system and addressing issues in that way, and building leadership that can continuously respond to changes and sustain itself. I would also add here that federal and state policy is important, but we believe that these grand challenges are best confronted at the community level. So a key question when we started is how do we define community? We do not have a strict definition. However, there are two important factors, geography and identity that help define it. Here are two examples. On the left is San Diego County South region, which is home to 500,000 residents. They joined Communities of Excellence through their backbone organization, the Health and Human Services Agency, which already serves San Diego County divided into the regions that you see in the middle graphic. When we initially began working with them, we thought that we would pilot this effort in a smaller area using just two of the cities, Chula Vista and National City. 
However, what we quickly learned was that this didn't make sense for this region. The South region has a strong identity and numerous organizations that operate across the entire region. So here, limiting their work to a smaller geography did not make sense. On the right side is the 18 counties of Northwest Missouri, which has a population of roughly 260,000 residents. It also has what they identify as six regional trade areas, which are larger towns or groups of towns where people come to do business, shop, etc. In Northwest Missouri, their work requires a dual approach. First, each of these regional trade areas has a local identity and work that needs to be done at the local level. However, in order to attract new business, more residents, and other key strategies that they need, a regional focus will be vital in order to compete with larger areas with similar economic profiles. These are two unique examples, which I hope illustrate that community is not necessarily the boundaries of city lines. So with a clear sense of urgency and an understanding of what we mean by community, I'd like to touch on why taking a systems view of community performance is so critical. We've discussed and intuitively know the interconnectedness of areas vital to our well-being, our health, educational attainment, and employment, to name a few. In addition to that is the understanding that every community has a system, whether it's a good one or not. As with an organization, if each sector or department of the community is trying to do its best for itself in isolation, you are not going to achieve optimal performance as a whole. And so reinforcing the value of a systems perspective is foundational to communities of excellence and how we work with communities. And this means managing all the parts of your community as a unified whole, ensuring that your plans, processes, measures, and actions are consistent, and ensuring that the different sectors of your community work together in an interconnected, unified, and mutually beneficial manner. So now I'm going to move into some of the details of the Communities of Excellence framework itself. We're all familiar, or most of us are familiar with the Baldrige criteria and some of its key factors that it's applicable to any organizational entity, scalable, benchmarks, excellence, et cetera. And so here is the Baldrige-based Communities of Excellence framework. It looks pretty similar, but there are some key differences. It is applicable to any community of any size and complexity. It helps unite leaders around a common language and uh, shared values, aligns people, resources, and plans, and importantly in communities, leverages the things that the community does well, its assets, its offerings, its uh, competencies and advantages. But one key difference here is the leadership structure. There is no CEO in a community, and leadership teams are made up of representatives and leaders from all sectors, all demographics, and all generations. In addition, all of our communities have a backbone organization that facilitates and drives the work, and we feel that this is critical to success. Like Baldridge, we have a community recognition and assessment program. So our communities can respond to the criteria questions, submit applications, and receive feedback reports with strengths and opportunities for improvement, much like in Baldridge. This year, we had eight community recipients representing the first two levels of our program. While COE was formed in 2013, much of our early years were focused on adapting the criteria for community performance excellence and piloting the framework in two regions, San Diego County, a large urban region, and Northwest Missouri, a large rural region, in order to understand how best to support communities in its adoption. In those two communities, we saw progress, but wanted more communities adopting the framework, learning from each other, and sharing their experiences. So in 2017, we launched a national learning collaborative beginning with nine communities. The collaborative is designed as a three-year engagement with cohorts of five to six communities. Currently, we have two cohorts and we'll be bringing in a third this October. As with an organization, we, help, we start by helping communities to develop a community profile and focus heavily on building strong, sustainable cross-sectoral leadership teams to represent the community and guide decision making. The community profile is so important because it helps community leaders and residents to think collectively as a community, ask if they have everyone at the table that they need across sectors and across generations and across economic groups. It's a helpful tool to learn how to work together, gets everyone thinking about the community in the same way and agreeing on and using the same common community language. So building off of that, 
you can see the three main objectives for year one of our collaborative, and they include establishing this diverse value-driven leadership team that I just discussed, developing your first Baldridge-based community profile, and identifying as a community desired outcomes and developing a community strategic plan focused on those outcomes. So now in our second year, we continue to learn about the level of readiness required for a community to engage with us, and we present these guidelines as a minimum. We look for communities that either have a pre-existing leadership team representing all sectors and generations or have commitments from leaders in key sectors. As I mentioned earlier, identifying a backbone organization that will serve as facilitator and drive the work is critical. We also need leaders to understand that this effort requires a commitment and that they are willing to share generously with our other communities and commit the time needed meaningfully to engage in this work. Finally, while not a requirement, we've seen that having individuals with a knowledge of Baldridge in a community is very helpful. So here is a map of the 14 communities that are engaged in our learning collaborative across our two cohorts. The darker blue is our first cohort, which started in October of 2017. And the lighter blue is our second cohort, which started this past October. What I like about this map especially is that you can see that our communities come from all across the country and include rural areas, urban areas, and suburban communities. We have rural towns like McCook, Nebraska, which with only 7,500 residents, and urban areas like St. Louis with 2.8 million. I mentioned the importance of the backbone organization to facilitate the efforts in the community. Many of our backbone organizations are health systems, six in fact, but we also have backbone organizations from city government, the United Way, Health and Human Services Agency, community foundations, and economic development agencies. So any organization can fulfill this role. I wish that I had time to tell you about all of the communities participating in our National Learning Collaborative, but today I'm going to highlight two of the communities from our first cohort. Both of these communities had pre-existing coalitions in place when they started their journey with us. However, that is not always the case with our communities. So starting with Kanawha County, West Virginia, the Kanawha Coalition for Community Health Improvement has been in place since 1994. In that time, they've had a number of huge accomplishments focused on the health of Kanawha County, but they knew that they could do more. They had questions when they came into this that they wanted to be able to answer, and their goal was to identify opportunities for improvement and how the coalition served its residents. One of the first things that we do in the Learning Collaborative is to help communities understand the questions in the community profile and discuss how to engage others in the community to respond to them. I'm highlighting this question about residents and other customers because for many of our communities, asking about their requirements and expectations of varying resident and other customer groups was very novel. So one of the first things that Kanawha County learned as they went about answering the profile questions was that the key characteristics of the different geographical areas of their county were very different. And the challenges for each area varied as did their requirements. So they worked with coalition leaders and residents to understand and document these varying requirements so that they can more effectively tailor their offerings to these unique and varying needs. Another thing that their executive director, Judy Crabtree, noted was that they had never considered that their other customers, such as commuters, employers in the county, and legislators, had different requirements and different expectations. In addition to that, they've identified four key community work systems, live, work, learn, and play. So while they continue their focus on the health of residents, Using the criteria to improve their current efforts, they're expanding, adding new leaders and organizations, and broadening their focus into these other areas to expand the impact of their work. The potential impact of what they're doing is exciting and underway as we speak. Finally, one of the values of the Learning Collaborative is to be able to learn from and share best practices with other communities. I had the pleasure of attending Kenai County Strategic Planning Forum back in 2017, and they had a very impressive process for identifying the top three challenges that the coalition would prioritize. This community forum was open to anyone in Kanawha County, and they used this assessment tool to narrow down the key community issues to the top three. This tool has been shared and adapted by many of our communities in their community strategic planning to prioritize key areas of focus. 
The second community that I would like to discuss is West Kendall, Florida. West Kendall is an unincorporated part of Miami-Dade County and home to 390,000 residents. Their backbone organization is the West Kendall Baptist Hospital and is a major employer in West Kendall and is committed to the health of their residents. They already had an initiative in place called Healthy West Kendall when they joined Communities of Excellence. One of their first acts as a coalition was to add the four Communities of Excellence drivers to the innovation drivers that they pre previously identified. Again, in addition to their continued focus on the health of their community, they are now addressing the other COE drivers of excellence, beginning with education. They've since held three educational summits, bringing in subject matter experts across the entire educational spectrum to understand West Kendall's challenges and develop objectives and action plans that align the people, plans, and resources in the community, leverage the assets and competencies already in place, and address key gaps in the educational attainment life cycle. They are doing this in a thoughtful, systematic way, using the information from their community profiles, identifying and measuring both process and outcome measures so that they can monitor and continuously improve how they serve residents. As an exciting update, they will be launching their next driver, Economic Vitality, in April. So much like Baldridge is called a journey, Transforming a community and changing lives takes time. Building a sustainable, values-driven community leadership team is key to the success of our communities, and change happens at the speed of trust, as they say. Taking part in this as a community leader is voluntary, so it has to be inspirational and aspirational. Some of the insights that I've captured from our communities are the importance of clear roles and responsibilities in the leadership, and the value of the community profile as a tool to learn learn how to work together. Adopting a common language is challenging, but very valuable. And one thing that I've seen that I think is a huge shift in thinking is, is from looking at activities to looking at outcomes and from thinking in silos to looking at the community as a system. So looking ahead, we will continue to work with our current two cohorts and will in fact add a new third cohort this fall. There are still openings if your community would like to take part. We will continue to partner with state and regional Baldridge organizations to support our community efforts, continue to refine the Communities of Excellence criteria and our approach to supporting communities in, adoption, in its adoption. And finally, we will continue to work towards congressional approval to include community as the seventh category of the Baldridge National Quality Award. So that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your time and thank you to the Baldridge Foundation for inviting us to participate. Thank you, Stephanie. We have a few questions from the audience. And so I'll give you the first one here, which is what has been your most significant learning in this process? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, it, honestly, I would say that it, it comes back to um, the, the difference between community leadership and the approach you would take in this in a community because, because this is voluntary. This is a, these are people who come from across the community who want to improve their community. So, so they have to, they have to want to be there and they have to understand and be united around the common vision. And so I've just seen the importance of, um, of how much building the capability and the capacity of the leadership as the foundation of this work is gonna drive this successfully more than anything. Our next question is somewhat similar. What, uh, what challenges are communities experiencing in the implementation of COE 2026? Well, I would say that that varies across all of our communities. Um, often it, it depends on the size and the complexity of the community. So in some of our rural, smaller rural communities, um, financial challenges are huge. Um, the fact that it's, it's the same group of leaders that, that are there because it's such a small area, so it's harder to get new people. Um, in some of our larger communities, just the sheer complexity of the number of different um, plans and different strategies and different activities that are going on across the community can make this very difficult. So it really varies by community. 
again, another similar question. What sectors appear to be the ones who are leading the effort within each community? Well, we've seen it, especially in terms of um, engagement in our backbone organizations, that the health sector is, um, is an early driver of this work. But we honestly, depending on the community, um, the nonprofit sector is very involved. Economic development is, is significant. Um, we'd like to see more uh, governmental involvement and business involvement, but I think that that will come with time. The next one is, what has been the biggest leadership challenge in implementing COE 2026 within each community, and are they the same across communities? I think that the biggest challenge that we've seen, and actually something we've been talking about a lot right now, is, is how to take what, what can be perceived as a very complex idea, Baldridge, and then Baldridge applied to a community, and put that in a language that anybody, you know, walking down the street in a community would embrace and understand. Um, and I, I think that's something that all of us who know Baldridge find as a challenge. And so for us, that's something we see is, is how, how, how are community leaders communicating this to their residents and to people around the community in a way that that is, is just really easy to understand? Um, I think that's that can be quite difficult sometimes. Okay, I'm going to combine these next two questions. They're they're real close. Um, how will you share your best practices, and will there at some point be a separate conference for COE 2026? Well, right now we partner with the um, Alliance to hold our uh, Communities of Excellence Conference alongside the Baldrige Fall Conference. And yes, at some point we would very much like to make that an open to the public conference, something that we're wor uh, working at. Right now, um, most of our best practice sharing goes on in our learning collaborative, and certainly our intent is to make that available to anyone. But I think that as we're still learning how to do this and how best to communicate information, um, we would like to do that in the near future, but I can't say exactly when we'll start doing that. But I will say that all of our communities generously share um, what they're doing and their approaches and their best practices. And so it's at, at some point, it's just a matter of, um, of asking them and connecting with them. Yeah, and I there was a part of the end of that second part of that question, which was, um, will there be a separate conference for COE 2026 and sharing of best practices for non-collaborative communities? So I guess the ones who are not currently involved with you, how would they learn more? Well, at this point, um, it's our main our main offering is our learning collaborative, and we're still exploring the best ways to um, spread that information out to non-collaborative participants. But I would say that we frequently travel to many of the state and regional um, alliance conferences. For instance, um, over the next few months, we'll be at a number of different state conferences, and that's one of the best ways to learn more about communities of excellence. Is we usually bring uh, community leaders with us to those, and so you have an opportunity to talk to them firsthand. The next question I have is, how easy slash difficult is it to gain the commitment from multiple stakeholders, i.e. healthcare, education, government, industry, and what do you do if a stakeholder says, I'm just not interested? Um, Again, I would say it depends on the community. It, it really helps to have a backbone organization that has a strong presence in the community or have the buy-in and the commitment of, of someone, or we call them sometimes a convener, someone that just has um, a, a lot of pull in the community that's able to bring people together and at least give you that initial platform to say, this is what this is all about. Are you interested? You know, Here's what we're looking at. What do we all think as a community? And sometimes people, um, you know, different organization leaders or different sectors just aren't interested yet. And that's where you just say, okay, thank you. Can we, you know, can we put you in, in a place where we can contact you again and update you? And that's what we've seen a lot of our communities do is, is that it's, it's, it's not right now is sort of the answer. And, and people need to come in at different times and that's fine. And we've seen that be successful. The next question I have is, does the development of the COE 2026 criteria 
mirror the development of the Baldridge criteria? Is it the same process? Good question. It's a very similar process. And in fact, when we initially developed the Communities of Excellence criteria, we worked very closely with the Baldridge program to ensure that um, that it, it aligns very similarly and that we could use similar assessment processes and that it would all work together well. So currently the format we use is the Baldridge Excellence Builder format. We don't have um, multiple questions built into our criteria yet. And um, that's probably something we'll do at a later time. However, we do have a very strict review process in terms of updates and refining the criteria and work very closely with Baldridge. Two more questions. Uh, the first one is, how can a consultant become more involved so that they can learn more to be able to help coach? That's a great question. I would suggest that you um, just start by contacting me or sending Communities of Excellence an email and we can start talking. That's also something that um, we're very much committed to working with the entire Baldridge community, the Baldridge M Enterprise to figure out the best way to bring this to communities and help support communities. So, so everyone is a part of this in some way and we would be open to those conversations. And the last question I have is, are all of the state programs supporting this effort? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, I, I am very open and have conversations with all of them. We meet regularly with the Alliance and um, various members of the Alliance board. And so, um, yes. Okay, great. Stephanie, thank you so much for being with us here today. That concludes our questions. And now we are going to transition over into Baldridge Foundation, part of the presentation. Uh, in concert with our strategy map, which is up there for everybody to currently see, um, the Baldridge Foundation continues to advocate on behalf of the Baldridge program and continues to fundraise for the entire enterprise across, uh, across the United States here. And so with that, the first thing I'll talk about is the new leadership that we have on board with the foundation for this year. Uh, we're well, currently in the process of welcoming two new board members, and those board members are Scott Reiner from Adventist Health in California and Russ Branzell, the president and CEO of CHIME, the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives. The federal budget process is currently in the middle of executing the fiscal year 19 budget, and we were proud to be a part of the effort to ensure that the Baldridge program remained in the budget for FY19 as well as FY20, as that budget is in the process of being delivered from the administration to both the House and the Senate for their input review and the beginning of their process. So we'll be working closely with members of Congress throughout that entire time. The new process, or the new Congress, the new 116th Congress is now in place, and uh, we've all been watching the news and watching them assume their positions here. It's, it's been a great um, and uplifting challenge here for the first part of the year, but we've enjoyed meeting each and every new member of Congress, especially those who will have an impact on the Baldrige, found it, or the Baldrige budget. Across the United States Senate, the new addition to the Commerce Justice Science Subcommittee is Marco Rubio from Florida. And Senator Rubio comes with a great deal of experience and support of his state program, the Sterling program, down in the state of Florida. So we're very encouraged by uh, him joining the subcommittee. The House of Representatives took a more dramatic uh, shift if you've been following the news. The Democrats are now in control of the House. And with that, uh, Jose Serrano from New York became not just the ranking member of the subcommittee, but the chair. And in addition to him, uh, Charlie Chris from Florida, Ed Case from Hawaii, and Marcy Kaptur from Ohio were added to the subcommittee. And we look forward to talking with each of those individual representatives as, again, we move through the process here in the spring. Uh, just as a point of note, uh, Chair Serrano has been extremely supportive of Baldridge these past few years in the House. He's been a real champion for us, and we appreciate uh, everything that he has done and will continue need to do. 
The foundation continues to work on re-engaging the president and getting the president to either the award ceremony or award recipients to the White House at some point to be recognized. Uh, this is one of our uh, major goals for uh, the upcoming advocacy efforts that we have going on. And so we will continue to push that at every opportunity and uh, hopefully get him there soon. Advocacy extends beyond working with members of Congress to promoting performance excellence across the United States and the world. And so in that effort, I uh, just wanna make everybody aware of our collaborative website, the Leader Dialogue website, where you can offer contributions as a blogger, uh, where you can download podcasts from our weekly radio program uh, in conjunction with the SOAR Vision Group and our great supporters in Tech Mahindra. Uh, we have an upcoming second CEO Innovation Council, and the theme is Performance Excellence in the Age of Consumerism with a focus on governance, and that will be taking place in June. So more to follow on that. I'd like to remind everybody again of the great opportunity we have with one of our strategic partners in Walden University and students can receive up to $3,000 in tuition grants if you are affiliated with the Baldridge National Program or a state program. And so if you are, log on to their website or log on to our website, which you can get a link over to the right part of theirs, and that will help you navigate through to find how to access these tuition grants. They can be applied to PhD programs as well as other programs that Walden University offers. like to remind everybody, if you're attending Quest, you will have the opportunity to receive the second edition of the Journal of Performance Excellence, trademarked by the Baldridge Foundation, which chronicles the year in review of the Baldridge Enterprise, with contributions from both the Baldridge Program and the Alliance for Performance Excellence. And so this is a great document. It is a great sales tool if you are a state program director or affiliated with the state program and would like to go out there and talk more about performance excellence and the ultimate journey to the national level. Uh, additional copies are always available through us and the information on how to obtain that is not only here but also on our website. would like to remind everybody about the opportunity we have to give back to the Baldridge Enterprise through Amazon. Amazon Smile is easy to log on to, and it doesn't cost you anything additional, but for each and every per purchase that you make, a proportion of that goes to the Baldridge Foundation. And so if you want to learn how to use Amazon Smile and designate the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award Foundation for your charity, you can log on to our website and we even have a tutorial, a video that you can watch that instructs you how to do that. I'd like to thank again our Quest for Excellence sponsors this year. Uh, we've added a number of them. And most importantly, I'd like to thank the Baldridge family, Midge, Molly, and Megan, who will be sponsoring the award ceremony itself this year. Their continued support helps us each and every day to continue to tell their story and to promote this great program. The foundation continues to support the Alliance for Performance Excellence. This past year in Denver, we were able to raise 83% of their sponsorship funds. And this year in 2019, the conference will be in Nashville, Tennessee on October 24 and 25. And we are already experiencing a great deal of support for their program in Nashville. The foundation awards program is accepting awards already for the next award cycle. And this award cycle, you will see at the Quest for Excellence Conference, just a stellar lineup of award recipients this year. Many of you remember uh, Joanne Sternkey from Pilwaukee School District as the superintendent. She will be awarded the Harry S. Hertz Leadership Award. Uh, we have uh, very, very powerful leaders out there like Joanne Jenkins, CEO of AARP, Allison Young from k and Management, who will be receiving Leadership Excellence Awards, and the E. David Spong Lifetime Achievement Award, 
will go to Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama. Lastly, uh, I just wanted to thank one more time, have an opportunity to thank uh, Jackie Calhoun for over four decades of stellar service to the government and to NIST specifically. Uh, if you didn't have the opportunity to catch Don Bailey's article on Jackie's career back in November on Blogridge, you can still dial in and uh, take a look at it. It's a great read and it walks you all the way through a little bit of the history of the program itself because Jackie's been with us for quite a while. But Jackie just recently retired and we wanna wish her all the best in her retirement. And again, thank her for all of her service to Baldridge and the Baldridge program. Jackie, we're certainly gonna miss you. So with that, I am going to turn over to Bob Fangmeyer who will update on the Baldrige program. All right, thank you, Al, and good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending upon where you are. Um, Jerry, I, I hope I have control. Oh, here we go, let's see. All right, show my screen, here we go, guys. All right, um, so again, thanks. Welcome, everybody. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you an update on the Baldrige program. And Jerry, I am trying to advance my slides and it's not, ah, here we go, great. So um, most of you know that uh, the framework has been updated. Back in December and January, we, we released the business, healthcare and education versions of the Baldrige Excellence Framework. In February, we released the Baldrige Excellence Builder. And just today, we're releasing the Baldrige Cybersecurity Excellence Builder. So if you haven't, uh, go check it out, download a copy. Uh, you can order hard copies if you like, uh, but see how that's advanced and evolved based on the changes to the Baldrige framework as well as the changes uh, to the NIST cybersecurity framework. I thought I'd share with you all uh, just some of the key things that we're working on right now. It's a very busy time for the program and I, this slide I'm sure uh, displays that visually. Um, but some of the key things, obviously our awards ceremony and quest conference 10 days from now, we kick this off, and we're looking forward to a, another exciting time honoring our newest award recipients and uh, taking advantage of their willingness, along with 18 prior award recipients' willingness to share their best practices. So if you're going, I am sure you'll have a lot to learn. Following that, we jump right into our examiner training, which occurs from April 23rd to May 10th. This year, we are uh, extending the training back to what we call two and a half days or three and a half days if you're a senior or a, a new examiner. We attempted to reduce the days for a couple of years uh, by one day, and we just weren't able to adequately uh, provide the uh, level of detail in certain areas. And so the feedback we received really drove us to go ahead and extend it back to the, the slightly longer training event each week. We expect to have around 350 examiners trained along with perhaps 70 or so uh, individuals who participate in our Baldridge Examiner training experience. Baldridge Executive Fellows Program, the 2019 cohort, will kick off uh, the Sunday of the award ceremony, so in 10 days. It's a year-long program. These are executives who have decided that they want to participate in this um, to learn from uh, direct interactions with and dialogue with Baldrige Award recipient executives, as well as learning from uh, one another. These are all high performing executives and they really do develop a, a very close relationship and take advantage of that um, in their, both in their careers and in their uh, challenges within their organization going forward. The program lasts a year, as I noted, and it closes out the Saturday before our annual ceremony. So, this upcoming Saturday, we'll be closing out the 2018 Executive Fellows Program. And the key part of that event is their sharing of their capstone presentations. This is a capstone project that they worked on over the course of the year, and it is uh, something that is of strategic importance to their organization. So it's really exciting to see how it all came together for them and the impact it's had on their organizations. The 2019 award process, the planning and preparation for that is well underway. Um, among that includes uh, the, the uh, potential 
changes that we have in store uh, for the future. In a little while, I'll talk a bit more about our award process redesign efforts, and I've shared that in the past, so I won't go into too much detail, but I do think uh, you'll be interested to hear where we stand right now. The 2020 case study, um, so we've been talking about taking perhaps a different approach to the case study for a little bit of time. And with the government shutdown back in uh, December and, and January, it really had an impact on our planning and our ability to advance the 2020 case study. So we've decided to go ahead and take advantage of this opportunity to pilot something different. Instead of crafting an entirely new case study for 2020, we're going to take the 2019 case study and we're going to treat it like a regular applicant organization would treat their own application. The case study will be evaluated by the, the training scorebook team, obviously, as well as all the examiners who participate in training. There is a feedback uh, report that is created related to the case study that will be used to um, modify and advance uh, the application and presumably the, the uh, fictitious operations of this case study organization and a new application or revised application will be written for 2020 for that same organization. So we think this will be really interesting to see. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how the scoring changes or doesn't change over the course of the, the two years for the case study. And depending on how successful this is, uh, we may use this as our approach going forward. The award process redesign, I mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Communities of excellence, we continue to support uh, Stephanie and Lowell and Rick and others in, in this effort. Uh, we're very happy to be a part of it and pleased with the progress they're making and look forward to their, their sharing that's going to happen at the Quest Conference in just a few days. Several of us uh, on the call actually are also working with an enterprise-wide, uh, a couple of enterprise-wide initiatives. This is between the Baldrige Program, the Alliance for Performance Excellence, the Baldrige Foundation, and ASQ. And one of them is an initiative to look at ways to strengthen examiner development across the enterprise, as well as enhance the um, consistency and the quality of uh, the examiner training that happens throughout the entire enterprise. And this one, we have broken it down into four components. One is creating a, a standardized curriculum regarding the content that should be conveyed during examiner training. Second is coming up with methodologies to actually assess the learning that is occurring through examiner training. Third is an approach to try and ensure that the facilitators are um, both highly qualified and very effective in uh, their role. I think those who've been through examiner training will recognize um, the critical importance of having a very uh, effective facilitator. And fourth is a potential for a examiner certification program. This one, uh, for those who've been around, this is not a new idea. It has bounced around a couple of times and we are once again exploring the potential of this. We are trying to make sure we are uh, surveying all of our key stakeholders very carefully. We have done a couple of surveys already. We're going to have focus groups as well, try and make sure we understand the potential positives and the potential negatives of any such program. But we're excited about what that might provide uh, the entire Bald Ridge community uh, if it indeed becomes something that um, is uh, appropriate to implement. Global Excellence Council. So the Baldwin's program is a part of a global excellence uh, initiative that used to be called GEM, the Global Excellence Model. We have recently changed that to be the Global Excellence Council. And we meet once or twice a year and our objective is to uh, really raise issues that we see happening in our regions. There are 12 different international programs that are currently participating. They include China and Japan and Singapore and Australia and Europe and the US and Mexico and South America and other places. So it's, it is truly global. And we are um, meeting just before the Quest Conference this Saturday for our second strategic planning initiative 
to look at how we can ensure that we are effective in advancing excellence across the globe. Cybersecurity, I mentioned the release of the Boulder Cybersecurity Excellence Builder. That initiative has been very, uh, I think, powerful in terms of bringing attention to Baldridge, as well as us being able to reach in and help address an area of national need uh, in this area of cybersecurity. The folks who developed in this cybersecurity framework are currently working on sort of a, a almost a companion framework for privacy. And we're involved in uh, dialogue with the NIST Applied Cybersecurity Division around their efforts in developing a, a privacy framework for data information and discussing whether or not there is an opportunity, a need, uh, or demand for a Baldrige-based uh, privacy framework similar to what we have for cybersecurity. Now, I will say this much. Uh, from my admittedly ignorant perspective, I would assume or I would have assumed perhaps that privacy is a component of uh, cybersecurity. In other words, if you have strong cybersecurity, that would include ensuring the privacy of your data and information as well. However, we're early stages in terms of our dialogue, and so it is unclear yet whether and to what extent uh, we will want to create some kind of new privacy tool or just integrate privacy into the cybersecurity tool we already have. Finally, the Workforce Development Initiative. Uh, this goes back to uh, a couple of different um, activities that occurred over the last year. And in just a few moments, I will give you a little more information on that as well. So the award process redesign. As noted, I've, I've shared this before. And so what I wanted to do at this point was just go over sort of at a very high level, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Well, the goals that we had for the award process redesign are First and foremost, we wanted to make sure that we maintain the integrity and the rigor of the award process. We did not want anything to sacrifice uh, that. And no matter what we do, we're going to make sure that the process is still uh, ensuring that we are identifying and highlighting role model organizations that deserve to be put on that podium. Second though, we wanted to make sure to determine whether or not we could create greater efficiency and utilize fewer resources. We wanted to make sure that we could create greater value for our applicants and for other stakeholders. And part of that value was both quicker and easier to digest feedback. Finally, we also wanted to see if we could develop a process that would permit site visits for all of our applicants. That, however, uh, did not come to fruition. We have not been able to come up with a way that we thought we could have the resources necessary to send 30 or 40 organizations and, and examiner teams to site visit. However, we have, in our estimation, met all of those other uh, goals in our award process redesign that we piloted last year and continue to pilot uh, today. Right now, there are uh, organizations being evaluated using this process at one of the state programs. And at the national level, we are also going to run another pilot this year uh, to make sure that we're comfortable and confident that these proposed changes are ones that will um, benefit everybody. Okay, a little bit more on workforce de development excellence. I continue to work with a cross agency group of folks from commerce and labor and the White House. Um, this idea comes out of two um, documents, I suppose, best word for it. First one came out in April last year, which was a study by the Council on Foreign Relations called the Work Ahead, which really noted the major discrepancy between the uh, need, for the needs of our economy and our organizations in terms of the skills that our, our workers had and the training that was being provided to those potential workers, both through the education systems as well as within companies and, and their uh, training and development programs. That led to, I believe, a, a release of an executive order by President uh, Trump in July that talked about a need 
to recognize companies that demonstrate excellence in workplace education, training and retraining policies, et cetera, to identify and adopt best practices, innovate the workplace policies and invest in their workforces. Now this aligns very closely to the Baldridge mission and what we currently do. And so we've been pulled into this initiative. What I'm not sure of still to this day is whether or not this initiative is going to end up being closely enough aligned to Baldridge that we will be able to leverage it, use it to pull other organizations in and perhaps have these organizations that are uh, recognized through this program that we're working on, uh, perhaps have them come and share their best practices at our conferences and other events. That would be ideal and I'm working hard to try and make that happen. However, uh, it is too soon to know for sure whether we will be that closely aligned or not. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, we've got two questions, Bob. The first one being, has the agenda for the conference been released and how do we access it? Yes, there is a uh, there's an agenda on uh, our uh, website. So if you go to the uh, Baldridge slash NIST um, dot gov, you can access that uh, through our conference link. And um, I believe those who have registered, um, I believe you may have already received or you will receive a announcement on how you can use the uh, app that we have created to access materials, agenda, bios, a whole bunch of different stuff um, on, on that conference app. And our second question was, you mentioned earlier not being able to have 30 to 40 site visits. Do we have that many applicants on an annual basis? So our goal has been to have 30 to 40 applicants uh, every year. And we are bouncing off sort of the bottom end of that every year. Um, so our goal with this whole effort to streamline the process is also to make it easier for organizations to participate. Sort of phase two of this uh, would be or will be uh, an effort to see how we can simplify and streamline the application process to also make it easier, not just for the examiners uh, and the judges and others, uh, but also make it easier for the organizations to uh, develop and provide their application materials to the program. So we, we expect that will also increase application numbers. Okay, well, Bob, thank you, and thank all the team members that you have up there at NIST for all that you do supporting the Baldrige program at Nationwide. Looking forward to seeing you here at Quest in a couple of weeks. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Lassiter, the chair of the Alliance for Performance Excellence. Brian? Thank you, Al. I see the slide says December, so I'm, I'm experiencing a time warp. Uh, I'm gonna wing it here. Hope those aren't the wrong slides in there, Jerry. But we're gonna we're gonna press on. I only have two, and we only have a few minutes, so I'll be I'll be brief. Uh, that one looks approximately accurate. I'll give a refresher for those of you that are not very familiar with the alliance. We are called the Alliance for Performance Excellence. We're the consortium of 29 programs across the United States, uh, mainly state, local, and regional programs, but one sector-based program in the American Healthcare Association. So we're the front door to, to a lot of the Baldrige work in the feeder system for the national program. These statistics are updated <clears throat> um, with year in 2018 uh, numbers. So um, actually we have, uh, yeah, 12, 1250 annual applications, 160 full 50 page apps, uh, closer to 1700 examiners, uh, 34 staff, uh, 460 other volunteers. That's in addition to our examiner pool across the nation and uh, 15,000 members across the United States. So quite quite a sizable network of organizations and individuals involved with uh, performance excellence. So some quick updates on uh, for this quarter. Next slide, Jerry. Uh, Al already mentioned earlier on the call, the fall conference dates are set for October 24th and 5th. Pre-conference is on the 24th, main conference 25th. It's in Nashville this year at the Gaylord Opry. Uh, it's a great facility and I know the, the conference committee's already uh, accelerating their efforts to build the program and invite speakers and, and lock down the, an exciting content for this year. So right after Quest, start to look for some of, some of those announcements and registration will be open and so forth. We're excited about that. 
I think I mentioned last time that the Alliance late in 2018 began offering supporting membership. Um, most of our members are program members. Those are the 29 programs serving as Baldridge programs for their state, local, and, and sector areas. But supporting members are all those that are, are supportive of performance excellence that are not program members. We have three right now. I'll also mention Walden University as a supporter of the foundation and the Baldridge program. They also support the Alliance as a, as a supporting member, as does Stratic Solutions and Mike Belter, who's an individual, our first individual as a supporting member. So if you're, if you're interested in more information on the benefits of being a member of the Alliance, you can reach out um, after the call. Um, <clears throat> we have one task force specific to the Alliance that's uh, currently working right now. Uh, many of you might know that we established some um, performance baseline uh, requirements for our top level awards gosh about six seven years ago and there's a, a task force that's working on setting guidelines maybe not requirements but guidelines for lower level awards across the alliance they hope to have their work completed this this summer and that really is to promote some consistency but also balance the need for local autonomy and, and innovation at the local level um, Stephanie talked considerably about the COE 2026 efforts. The Alliance is proud to, to collaborate on that as well. We've got several pilots going on across the nation. I think Stephanie mentioned a few of them uh, on how do we integrate examiner training and build COE into Alliance member conferences. Uh, what do the award levels look like as the uh, COE is starting to build their own recognition levels? So we're excited to partner on, on many of the operating components of COE uh, in, throughout the Alliance. And Bob just mentioned the uh, Baldrige Enterprise Task Force of the Alliance are involved with both of those efforts, the examiner training and the business development task force. It's trying to grow the pie, so to speak, to get more organizations involved with this effort. And the last thing I'll mention in the interest of time is uh, our board members. See the different colors there. The lighter blue shading are the new board members and the darker blue are reelected members. I'll call out that uh, Liz Menzer is the vice chair. Uh, Jerry Markley, <clears throat> out of Michigan, is the treasurer, and Ann Warner is the secretary. The four of us represent the elected officers of the alliance, but all of those on the list are board members. So feel free to reach out to those in your, your state and regions that have a connection. So with that, I know we only have about two minutes left. Al, I want to cut my comments short and see if there's questions for me or anyone else. I don't see any questions for you, Brian. So everybody, I just want to thank you one more time for attending the Baldridge Foundation's quarterly webinar, where we try to bring you information from across the entire enterprise and the latest developments. Once again, hope to see you all at Quest in just a couple of weeks here. And our next webinar will be June 27th, 2019 at 1 p.m. Thanks again and have a great weekend.